So I have over here several compasses, um, and you'll notice that each one of these compasses is pointing in the same direction, right? Where, where is it pointing? Do you know what, what, the, what direction the compass points in? North, right? Okay. So they're all pointing in the same direction. And I can show you that they're pointing in the same direction. Like, say, I, take, I can take a magnet, and I can deflect these compass needles with the magnet, okay? And then they come back in the same direction, right? You can deflect them, and then they come back to the same direction. So it doesn't matter that they uh, get into trouble. Then I can spin this, I can spin this, uh, these needles, okay, and there's still the, sorry, I can spin the compass, but the needles sort of stay in the same direction. <coughs> okay, fine, that's very nice. Um, so, <coughs> So the question that's going to come up, and I'll let you, I'll, I'll give you some time to think about it, is why, you know, does this magnetic needle always want to point in the same direction? So I hope you're thinking about the question, and the question that's coming up is, why does this needle always point in the same direction? I've now convinced you that the compass needle always points north, uh, and now you can answer the question. All right. So let's uh, look at the, what you guys said, which is all said D because the Earth behaves like a bar magnet. Very good. And that's the correct answer, uh, which is D. So, and, and the, the reason I gave you this question, I, I, have, I have a cultural reason to give you this question. And this was a breakthrough <clears throat> by one of the scientists who came just before Galileo, okay, he, he, he comes a little bit later than what I'm talking about today, but it, it comes at the time just before Galileo, and his name was Gilbert. And since there was so much interest in the compass because of navigation, Gilbert and others were very interested in magnetization. Okay, what is, what is a magnet? And basically what Gilbert realized, that you can take any magnet, and the magnet will have what do you call a north and a south pole. And so I can take, for example, this bar magnet over here, and you know you can call this end of it north, and you can call this end of it south, and you got a north-south magnet. And what the needle really is, is just a bar magnet with north and south pole that's suspended about a point and then floated in water, okay, or, or put on a cork or something and then floated in water. And then it'll always point in the same direction. And he is the one who figured out why the magnet with the north-south pole will always point in this direction. <clears throat> and he's the one who figured out that the Earth itself is a bar magnet. Okay? So namely, the Earth behaves as if there was a magnet inside it. Right? And so if, this red, if red is north right, <clears throat> and blue is south, then the bar magnet of the Earth what would be the polarity, what would be the, with the sign of the polarity on, of this guy in, in the bar magnet of the Earth? Would it be north or would it be south? This, this would be south, right? Because the north part is attracted to the south. Okay? So when north is attracted to the south, the magnet is always pointing towards the south. So it's really the south of the, of the bar magnet. Now, it turns out, <clears throat> as was later discovered, is that there is no bar magnet inside the Earth. However, there are phenomena going on inside the Earth that are equivalent to producing a bar magnet. And we will talk about some of these phenomena next time. Not next time, but when we do the updates of Chapter 4. In particular, there's, iron, there's an iron core that's circulating along with the Earth, and there are currents in that core. And it's the currents, electric currents in that core that cause this uh, thing to behave like a magnet, and I'll show you this. Right? So here's another, here's another magnetic needle that's suspended, right? And it's supposed to point again towards the north. You can see the, the, um, um, the needle try to line up in a certain direction. But there's another property that Gilbert discovered, which is this property here, which is not only the alignment of the needle towards one direction, but also the fact that the needle wants to dip down, you know, or wants, to, wants to line up as if it's being attracted by the Earth. See, that's because, again, this part, this pole, 
is being attracted by the north pole of the mag or south pole of the magnet. So Magnetic dip is, or the inclination, is how much below the horizontal the magnetic field points. And so we need a special type of compass, a dip compass or dip meter, to get that information. So currently the needle can move around in that plane and will align the rotation axis of the dip meter with the compass needle such that zero degrees is at the north end of our magnet. Then I can rotate this 90 degrees and the needle can oscillate and move in this vertical plane. The dip angle is defined from negative 90 to positive 90 with positive dip being a measure below the horizontal. So, so based on the fact that he saw this kind of behavior and this kind of behavior from the dip and the uh, orientation of the magnetic pole he deduced that the earth must be behaving like a magnet. But Gilbert also discovered something else which is going to be uh, important for the update to the next chapter which is uh, the update on electricity. So here's a nice picture of Gilbert demonstrating the first few uh, examples of electricity uh, which, which I'm sure that you've seen before which are static electricity, right? So if I take a, uh, a rod of plexiglass, okay, and I take some wool, I think this is wool, and I charge it up, right, like I told you before, right, I can uh, strip the electrons off of this thing, right, and I can make them positively charged. I'm repeating now Gilbert's demonstration, right, I can pick up, and I didn't do very well. <laughs> okay, I can pick up uh, styrofoam and so on. If I don't charge it up, of course, <clears throat> Is this, this might be still charged up, but see, nothing, nothing really happens, right? Uh, oh, well, <laughs> there, was, there was a little bit of charge on it. And then I can charge it up again. And then I can pick up styrofoam. Because there's static electricity, you've all studied that. <clears throat> uh, here's another interesting demonstration involving static electricity that you might enjoy. Or think about some variations of it for your own demonstration, okay? Now this guy is not styrofoam, it's conducting, right? It's, it's a soda can, um, and it's conducting, and I can charge up this guy here, and, and I can attract it. Now why is it doing that? Although it's not charged up, well, what happens is when I bring a charge uh, near it, um, this piece of metal has charge in it, okay? And when I bring this, uh, let's say this is positively charged, when I bring it near the soda can, the electrons in this metal redistribute themselves so that the, some come closer and some go further away. And so they polarize themselves. So now this becomes plus minus object and then it becomes attracted to this object which is only, say, minus. <clears throat> so that's the way in which you can uh, you know, demonstrate electricity. Um, here is an example of two balloons that were, you can, uh, you can have not only attraction, but you can also have repulsion with electricity. So here's an example of two balloons, which was, uh, the, those guys were trying to make set up for you to show. That, then if I, if I charge them up again, I'm not sure this is going to work, okay? Because <laughs> I had a lot of trouble making this work. But if I charge this fellow up, and then I charge this fellow up, go away, go away. <laughs> And they're supposed to repel each other, but you know, with my luck, they're going to attract. No, they're going to repel. Yay! Okay. <laughs>
Now, what are some interesting, really interesting demonstrations that were done uh, during the time of Gilbert and after that? People were very fascinated with these frictional electricity effects. And if, in fact, if you look at Gilbert's picture here, you'll notice that there's a machine back here. Yeah? I, I have this machine here, okay? There's a machine back here, and instead of rubbing by hand, he could use this machine to charge things up much more intensely. Okay? And um, people would go around having electrical shows, and in one of these electrical shows, they would have this machine that would you know, rub against his, the soles of his feet, and charge him up, and then he could draw a spark against uh, another guy. Or what was more fun is if they invited some you know, pretty girl to come up, or, or pretty guy to come up, or handsome guy to come up, and they charged him up, and then they kiss and spark. You know, they get uh, uh, spark. Okay, so um, so I have this machine over here. Let me first show you this machine, um, which will charge up these two uh, balls of metal by by friction. And then uh, you'll see that when they, when they touch, they will spark with each other. Okay, let's, let's hope. I don't have to bring them too close. I guess I have, to, I have to bring them closer. All right, so let me put the light down. All right. So I'm, I'm doing the same friction trick, okay? Now I can try to make them spark when they're a little bit further apart. It's a little bit more interesting. And this is, these were very, very uh, amusing experiments for the people at the time. And, this, and the, the more you charge them, the, the, the bigger the spark, and the, uh, the, 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 the stronger the, the shock, okay? uh, and, and the more fun they had, right? So, so what was happening, of course, was that you were building up the electric charge very high, and then the electric charge discharged. But the air was in the way, right? So normally the electric charge could not jump across. But if you got enough charge, you can actually take the electrons from the air molecules, from the nitrogen and the oxygen, and strip them. And okay, then that's called the breakdown of the gas. Okay? And when you strip the electrons, it's the same thing that happens in those tubes. Okay, you got the strong voltage, and the electrons go across, and they light up the air in between, and that's your lightning. And the guy who realized that this, is, this spark business is really lightning, is our good old friend, Benjamin Franklin. Okay? So Benjamin Franklin played these same experiments yeah, of repelling uh, charged objects and attracting charged objects and drawing sparks and so on. Now this comes a little later than the time I'm talking about, but I thought it was a little fun to show you that, that Benjamin Franklin was the first guy to realize that these electrical sparks that I showed you are really <clears throat> the same as what's happening when you get lightning. Um, where's my intensity now? Hey, there it is. Okay. Um, and he actually proved this. And the way he proved this is really interesting if you're interested in the history of, uh, of, of American history. Then you can see that what Benjamin Franklin did was he did this wonderful experiment where he waited for a thunderstorm when lightning would take place, and he flew a kite, okay, and he had a conducting wire down the rope, down the string of his kite, and at the bottom of the conducting wire he had a key, and so he charged up the key with the electricity from the lightning, and then he drew a spark from this. That was a very dangerous experiment, okay. In fact, if he had been outside, he had he had his son help him with this experiment. It's kind of a foolish thing, anyway. If if he had been outside and had gotten slightly wet, he could have been electrocuted. Okay? Because the voltage and the electricity is so strong that if it goes through your body, then, then you're in trouble. But fortunately, he was smart enough to be safe and he stood inside and he took the spark uh, on, you know, on, on his knuckles uh, against the key. Uh, he was lucky. There was a guy, after he wrote about his, his work, uh, a few months later, there was a guy in Russia, St. Petersburg, Russia, who tried the same experiment. Of course, now Frank, Franklin didn't write that you have to be underneath and uh, out of the rain. And so this guy was out there, you know, with the sky, and he, he, was, he was electrocuted.